So yeah, so I'm going to talk basically, me and Kristen are going to talk about this box. And so I'm going to talk about the first half, the, the library prep part. And then Kristen will talk a little bit about the sequencing uh, part. And so the, the goal here is really, how do you go from cells that, that uh, John Paul just talked about that have the pooled CRISPR in them to a library um, that you can then sequence? What are some of the common concerns and things to be um, thinking about when, when doing this library prep? And what are some tricks that we already know work? And what are some things that are still um, being, being worked on? So Kristen's going to talk more about this. But this is the ultimate goal um, when we're doing you know, Illumina sequencing, which is what the vast majority of the output of, of pooled CRISPR screens is going to be. Um, this is the standard structure of an Illumina sequencing fragment. Right? It has constant regions on the ends. These are basically adapters for the Illumina machine. Um, it has barcoding indexes. It has a primer region. That's the sequencing primer, essentially. And then the actual CRISPR uh, guide RNA part is a constant region. You know, this is in, in, on this side is you know, the U6 promoter, for example, and then the variable guide RNA. And so the goal is you know, we have plasmid that has, or you know, genomic DNA that has this part in the middle. How do we make this entire double-strand uh, DNA molecule? And so what I'll talk about very quickly today is sort of going through that. So how to, going from a cell population, you know, we have lysis and isolation of genomic DNA. Then we have PCR. And what, the way that we typically do this is sort of two steps. The first step to put sort of half the adapter on. And then the second step to do final barcoding and put the full adapters on. And really, the, the main reason for that is, is both because it works better and because these full uh, adapter tails are actually quite long. And it would require like 100 plus space adapt, uh, oligos to do that in one step. So it's doable, but not ideal. OK. So genomic DNA extraction, you know, if many of you, I'm sure, have done this before. We don't really do anything super different here, with the exception that, as John Paul mentioned, you know, you're talking about actually a fairly large number of cells. Right, so if you're doing you know, a 12,000 guide pool, you have 100x coverage. That's actually you know, 12 million cells, which actually is about 80 micrograms of genomic DNA. So you're already in the range of, you know, outside the range of sort of standard mini prep kits. You're already in the sort of midi or maxi prep type kit range. And you want to make sure that you, you, know, you actually isolate genomic DNA from all of those cells. Because if you go through the whole process of doing this whole screen and keeping good representation, you don't want to then wait, lose half your genomic DNA during the, the prep. Um, there's a couple of other notes here. So a, a few things that, that some of us have seen. So we've seen for sure that you know, in standard genomic DNA preps, you actually pull down a decent amount of RNA as well, fairly commonly. Um, this is not ideal, both because these, you know, these kits they have a maximum binding capacity. If that gets sucked up by RNA, that's not good. Um, it's also bad because the RNA inhibits the PCR if you have lots of RNA uh, floating around those PCRs. So the simplest way is just to take any sort of standard RNA treatment. Um, this is one example that I think we used in our lab. But you know, any sort of RNA treatment where you add it to the DNA, you incubate it, and then you do some sort of genomic DNA cleanup afterwards. And that seems to help actually quite a bit in terms of getting better data at the end. There's also some evidence, and this is what we've seen uh, particularly in the lab, that if you do sort of a lightly fragmentation of the genomic DNA, that also seems to help the PCR amplification. Um, you know, not shearing down to 100 base fragments, but just breaking it from you know, large, you know, multiple KB or uh, tens or hundreds of KB pieces down to you know, a few KB, maybe. OK, so that's pretty straightforward. And then the, really, the, the, the key comes into the PCR. So, Zooming in sort of from, from what I showed before, so you know, we have a variable guide RNA region here. This is you know, 19 or 20 bases. And then the, the sort of standard, you know, in this case, it's the guide RNA, um, the, the tracer RNA. In this case, it's the, the promoter of the, the sgRNA. So the two steps are basically using a, a PCR primer that targets this constant region and has some of the adapter. And then a second primer that contains these Illumina barcodes. And Kristen, I think, will talk a little bit more about this, but this is how you can pool many samples together in one sequencing lane. So we don't usually need you know, a full sequencing lane per individual replicate experiment. So that's you know, this, this basically you know, PCR1, gel extraction, PCR2. For PCR1, I'm not going to go through this, but you know, it's, we don't really, there's, there's not really much tweaking in terms of, sort of the standard uh, PCR reaction conditions. Um, but there's a couple of key notes here, and those are really what I'm going to talk about. So one is be very careful of contamination. Um, and I'm saying this both because theoretically and also from experience. If you do these library preps, 
on the bench next to the place where someone else is making MIDI preps of CRISPR plasmids in your lab, you will get those plasmids in your library PCR, for sure. Um, you know, you don't, you're not getting a ton of, you know, in, if you have genomic DNA from 12 million cells, there's only really 12 million copies of that DNA there. If someone has a MIDI prep of one plasmid, it's easy to have 12 million copies of that in the tube easily. So it is surprisingly easy to get contamination. So keep it separate, you know, particularly from the bacterial bench or people that are doing large preps of these things. But, you know, if you can have separate pipettes and, and, and separate water and, you know, stuff like that is, is really ideal. Um, so you have this PCR. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sort of PCR um, cycle numbers and stuff in a second. Um, the gel extraction is relatively straightforward. You know, we run on standard agarose gels. At that point, you know, the concentration is relatively high, so it's not, we're not as paranoid about it. Um, you know, be careful, but not, you know, super paranoid. The key benefit there is you want to remove, obviously, genomic DNA, unincorporated primers, buffers, enzymes, stuff like that, but this is a relatively straightforward sort of standard uh, gel extraction. Um, PCR2, the same, same, you know, standard PCR reaction, um, but now using um, alumina barcode primers. So the, the key question and this key issue that we've come into with these, with these PCRs is, comes down to the DNA amount. So the, the number that uh, John Paul showed was, is sort of this number, right? If you have 12,000 guides, you want 100x coverage, you can say, well, about a million cells has about 6.6 .6, uh, micrograms of DNA, so you wind up with something like 80 micrograms of DNA. What many of us have seen, and this is not something that's, that's newly discovered by us, this has been known in the pooled shRNA screen uh, field for a long time, is that genomic DNA at large quantities inhibits PCR. And so this is an example of, of what we actually have seen um, from uh, some qPCR data, where if you add more and more genomic DNA per reaction, you, you, know, you do more and more, and then you hit a point where you start to inhibit, and then you hit a cliff where you really inhibit. And this happens actually somewhere in the, it depends on the PCR enzyme you use and, and, and things like that, but it happens around a few hundred nanograms of, of genomic DNA per PCR, right? And so that number is obviously annoying because if you're trying to prep 80 micrograms of DNA and 500 nanograms is the most you can do per PCR, you're doing 180 PCRs or 160 PCRs, I guess, and then pooling that all. And, um, and right now that, the only answer I can give you is basically have fun doing 160 PCRs. <laughs> um, we, we in our lab are working on some other methods and we have one that we're hoping to publish fairly soon to try to fix this and make it better. Um, but most of, what I've, most of the people right now that are doing you know, good quality library preps are basically solving this by doing a lot of PCRs. Um, and so then, you know, so then the other question comes down to so, you know, you have you know, DNA per cycle. The other question then comes down to how many PCR cycles do you need to do, right? And so I, the way I think about this in my head is to start from the second PCR. So if you do the first PCR, you get enough to see it on a gel, right? And if you get enough to see it on a gel, that's actually basically already more than you need to sequence. Um, Kristen will give you some of the actual numbers, but usually if you could see it on an agarose gel, it's enough to sequence. And so the second PCR, basically you're putting these full uh, adapter, uh, adapters onto the library in order to sequence it on the machine. So all you really need to do at that second stage is enough so that the majority of the molecules have the adapters on both sides. And so if you work out the math and you go through, well, you, know, the, you start with none, you know, every cycle you get linear amplification of, of fragments that have the adapter on one side. And you know, the exponential part of having them on both sides only really kicks in after a few cycles. So you really need to do at least six PCR cycles in the second round to get, basically to have the most of your library actually have the adapters on it. So okay, so PCR2, you're gonna have six cycles, but that's amplifying it actually quite a bit. And so to sequence, you know, this is actually higher than, than Kristen really needs, although she will be much happier if you can give her this. But like I said, you know, this visible band here is already probably four or five times this amount that you need. And so when you run this first PCR, you know, you don't have to see a band like this. You know, this means that you've really way overdone uh, the PCR that you need. And really the, the, the reason you don't want to do that actually has, is, is not just that doing more PCR is a waste of time, um, but that doing more PCR leads to a couple problems. So one problem is that a good library, you know, for this, 
really has one size, right? Because you know that you're using constant primers, the guide RNAs are all the same size. So it should be one single size. If you do too much PCR, what actually happens is first you run out of PCR primers, and then because all the libraries have the same sequence, you start to get weird either concatamers or these bubble products. And the way you can see this is if you run the library on either an agarose gel or a tape station, or this is a tape station trace, you start to see these larger products here. And those larger products are basically, you've stopped amplifying and now you're creating sort of weird products that sometimes are fixable and sequence okay, sometimes create concatamers that don't really sequence well. In both cases, they mess up the quantitation of the library, so it can mess up the, the loading of the sequencing machine, and it's not really ideal. The other thing is, you know, when you think about what PCR is actually doing, right, if you have to do a lot of PCR to get enough material to sequence, what that means is that you're starting with a very low number of unique molecules. And you know, if you're doing less PCR, that means you actually have more unique molecules to start with. And this is something that we've, we think about a lot in our lab because we, we do a lot of other things with the um, clip and chip and, and other sequencing methods. But what we've seen in general is that once you're above sort of the 15, 20 PCR cycle range, the fraction, your, your PCR duplicate rate is essentially very, very high. And this is something to keep in mind with uh, CRISPR sequencing. You know, if you have to do a ton of PCR and then sequence hundreds of millions of reads, at some point what you're sequencing is just PCR duplicates of the original molecules. And you're not really, you're losing that quantitative relationship between number of reads and number of guides that were actually in your, in your library. So the thing is, so the recommendation is basically to actually do this. So for each, you know, at least the first couple times you're doing this, you know, try to keep the genomic, you know, I would test this yourself um, with the enzyme that you want to use, the DNA polymerase, um, the, the, the PCR enzyme you want to use, and the conditions you want to use. Um, use as much genomic DNA as you can up until you hit that point where you're seeing inhibition, and then use the least number of PCR cycles that you can. And so this is an example from someone in our lab where they did a bunch of different conditions, a bunch of different uh, amounts, and you know something like this is probably where I would actually stop, is where you know she was able to push the amount a little bit higher here for some reason, um, but then this cycle number is really already enough, and I wouldn't, you know, you don't need to go any more than that. Um, the cleanup of the library at the end is sort of standard if you've done any sort of RNA-seq or chip-seq or anything like that. Um, there's lots of different options. You can use sort of bead-based cleanups, PCR-based cleanups, um, concentration. Uh, we generally run tape stations. You can do bioanalyzers. Uh, Kristen will talk about that, and she can help you with that as well. Um, and, and then you, know, you send it off to Kristen uh, for sequencing. And yeah, so, so basically that's, you know, the, the summary from this side is, you know, you, it's basically genomic DNA extraction, which is fairly straightforward, but, you know, you want to be careful about keeping, you know, making sure you're using conditions that work for the number of cells that you're using. Um, PCRs, you want to make sure that you, you know, don't overload your, your reactions. You want to try to use, you know, as much genomic DNA as you can, but be aware that using too much can, can cause problems. Um, and the nice thing about this is it uses, at least most of the standard methods use sort of standard Illumina uh, multiplexing and barcoding, and, and Kristen will talk about that. So it's, you know, we actually have gotten very good results even by pooling these with RNA-seq samples and things like that, um, which actually helps in many cases to, to solve some of the diversity problems. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's it, and now Kristen will talk about the sequencing part. The name. Ooh, who wants this mic? Sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, and uh, so she would be the one you would be talking to once you have your library ready Thank you. to go. Okay, let's. I'm going to try and keep us on time so we can enjoy each other's company and visit our generous sponsors during the break as well. And really, this part's the least important in a way because at this point, we're here to help you. And so, a lot of the stuff I'm going to tell you about now, we've, we've uh, 
perfected by trial and error. Um, and you'll be in good hands as long as you let us know that you're sequencing CRISPR screens. Actually, what's kind of fun about this whole presentation is you can really feel how the advice is coming from other people's failures. And we're all trying to help uh, prevent you guys from reinventing the wheel, right? And where did my presentation go? There we go. OK. So we're just on the top half of the sequencing and library uh, uh, stage of the, of the presentation overview. I'm going to talk about uh, sequencing your CRISPR screen libraries. Uh, the, the talk will basically go through an overview of Illumina-based sequencing. I'm going to go through that quickly. If you're really interested in how Illumina sequencing works, uh, there's some links to some videos on Illumina's website, or you can come and chat with me in person. Sometimes it's a little hard to figure that stuff out, and I can give you a quick primer, and you'll, you'll know everything you need to know about throwing your stuff on a sequencer. We're going to talk about the limitations of sequencing CRISPR libraries, which I think is the most important part, and the best practices to overcome these limitations. And then briefly, um, how you can kind of evol evaluate your DNA sequencing quality coming off these screens, especially if you're sequencing either on your own instruments or on um, in other facilities where they may not have as much experience or they may not give as much feedback about sequencing quality. So uh, Eric has already showed you sort of the anatomy of a sequencing primer with these um, constant important regions. The P5 and P7 are the regions that bind to the flow cell. They cannot be changed. You must use the right sequence or you won't make any clusters on the flow cell. The other regions can be changed depending on your um, approach. But as Eric pointed out, for the CRISPR screens, we mostly use um, pretty constant standard Illumina sequences. We have a couple different kinds of sequencing that we do. Most of the CRISPR screens are done by single read. We bind this library to a flow cell. We stick down a read one sequencing primer, and we read generally 75 base pairs across that DNA insert. This would be known as a single read or SR75 sequencing. Once the read one is completed, that primer gets washed off, and an index sequencing primer comes in. This can come in both at the uh, three prime end of your sequencing library and sequence this I7 index or it can come in at the 5' prime end and sequence this I5 index. So that's known as dual indexing when you sequence both the I5 and the I7, and single indexing if you just sequence the I7 region. Um, and this just allows you to mix multiple samples or you know, from multiple different time points or stages of your screen into one sequencing lane because the capacity of the sequencers is so great nowadays that you don't need one single sequencing lane or sequencing run per experiment. If you would like to sequence from both ends of your molecules, as sometimes uh, people do for CRISPR screens if they're looking for two guide RNAs, you can just come back in. You flip the molecule around. It's not important why. Uh, come back in with a second sequencing primer and read from the other end of your sequencing library, from the three prime end, backwards towards the five prime end to get the second read. And this is known as paired end, PE, sequencing. Uh, we generally sequence these as paired end 100s on the high output sequencers. And if you sequence on our lower output sequencers, you can kind of design how many reads you like to sequence. So just a quick overview so that you understand some of the, the limitations of CRISPR libraries. Illumina sequencing is sequencing by synthesis. You stick your, as, we, as we've pointed out, you stick your library down onto a flow cell bed. You stick down a sequencing primer. And then you sequentially add bases and take a picture of the added bases. Um, in parallel across many molecules stuck down to the flow cell. So every library is sequenced from the same primer. The primer sticks down to all of your libraries, and it marches along sequentially, so that if you had many growing clusters like this across your flow cell, you'd be taking pictures of all of the clusters at each cycle. So we're going to just keep going, and we bring in some different bases. We take a picture. Um, and, and at the end, the, there, there are software algorithms to spit out the sequences that will be of interest to you as you head into your analysis. So one thing to consider if you're thinking about how to design your CRISPR screens is that they're marching along all at the same time uh, spatially across your library. If you want to fit onto our most common and least expensive sequencing run, you need to 
you need to have those guide RNA sequences captured within the first 75 base pairs of the P5 end of your sequencing library. So you're going to have your constant sequence, the promoter for your guide RNAs, upstream. That's where you, you sit down your uh, PCR1 oligos. And then you're going to sequence across this guide RNA, this diverse pool of guide RNAs. Design this so that this can be completed in 75 base pairs. Don't make it 78, because you're going to miss the last three base pairs, and you're going to have to go on a different kind of sequencing run. It's going to cost you a little bit more money. And it's also going to be a lot faster if you fit into our most common sequencing um, pipeline, and that's the single read 75. It used to be single read 50, so we've given you a little more space, because single read 50 was a little challenging sometimes to hit. Um, but with 75 base pairs, the vast majority of single guide screens um, should be able to be designed to grab that guide RNA within the first 75 base pairs. All right, so the main issue that we have had problems with on the CRISPR screening is nucleotide diversity. So the way the libraries get designed is, is, is important, and, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But let me explain to you what I mean by nucleotide diversity. Because the sequencer starts with a primer, and every the primer sits down across the, each library, and the bases get read sequentially, you need to have good diversity across your libraries for each nucleotide. You don't want to have all G's at the first position and all T's at the second position. We're going to get into the reasons why later. The first four bases are the most important to have the nucleotide diversity across because that is where the sequencer, that is the data the sequencer uses to, to set its algorithms and its thresholds for base calling. And so if you can get across the first four, uh, it's, it's very helpful if those are diverse. All right. So, Shotgun sequencing libraries are by design very diverse because the, the DNA is randomly shared or the RNA is randomly shared in the case of RNA-seq libraries. And what you generally find when you sequence these libraries is that they have, uh, you know, the, the base diversity reflects the base diversity of the total genome of whatever organism you're sequencing. Amplicon sequencing libraries, which are what we're using for CRISPR, if you stick down a primer and you start sequencing everything at the same exact region across that um, guide RNA promoter, you're going to have very low diversity. So that the first cycle, for instance, is all going to be Gs. And the reason this is a pro problem is because you're going to go from this region here where, where it's constant in every single library. You're going to set all your algorithms to this, oh, I think I expect one base pair at every position. And then you're going to get into your guide RNA where you're going to have nearly perfect diversity and the sequencer is going to go haywire and it's going to not really understand how to interpret those base calls. Um, so the CRISPR sequencing problem is that low nucleotide diversity makes it extremely difficult to set signal thresholds and also to determine cluster boundaries. So Let's talk first about setting, setting signaling thresholds, because this applies to all of the sequencing types. The way the sequencer works is it, it takes a picture at each, of, at each cycle, or each, you know, each position in the, in the library, for each fluorescently tagged nucleotide. So each of them is in a different wavelength, and it takes four different pictures. If all of your signal is in channel G, and you're dark for C, A, and T, the sequencer is going to overexpose. It's like looking on a microscope. You're, it doesn't know that there's no, sig no um, signal there at all, so it just overexposes the image and, and makes for poor, it makes it difficult for it to distinguish signal from noise. And then you go to cycle two and you add, you know, C now and there's no G and it sets something, it was looking for a certain level of G and now it's only seeing C. It confuses the sequencer so that it really can't set clear thresholds for how it determines these base calls. All right, so, so you. So you run into to real problems just with setting these signal thresholds if you only have the same exact base pair, particularly over those first four bases where the sequencer sets these algorithms. Then there's a second problem, but we should mention that it's only a problem on certain types of flow cells. There's two types of flow cells, a random flow cell, a random uh, probe flow cell, and a pattern flow cell. For the random flow cells, the DNA probes are just randomly distributed across the slide. They're basically float on, they stick down, and they're, they're, they're present in excess. Um, clusters can define, clusters can form at uh, any of these non-defined sites on the flow cell, and they can easily overload because there are more oligos loaded onto the flow cell than you really have room for sequencing clusters to grow. The random flow cell types of sequencers are the MySeq, the NextSeq, and the HiSeq 2500. The 2500 is probably the most commonly used for the CRISPR screens in our shop. Um, 
of these sequencers. Then we have the newer sequencers that use a pattern flow cell. These DNA probes are in nanowells at fixed locations, so clusters can only form in nanowells, and the sequencer knows where to look for those nanowells. So they're harder to overload, which is a huge advantage, particularly for a sequencing core, uh, where we're sequencing lots of different kinds of libraries. Um, and they allow higher cluster density, so you can just get more sequencing data from your flow cells. And the, the pattern flow cell type sequencers are the X10, the HiSeq 4000, which we have in our shop, and the newer NovaSeq. All right, so for the random flow cells only, the low nucleotide diversity adds a second problem, and that is that it's difficult to determine cluster boundaries. So the sequencer doesn't know where to expect clusters because there's so many oligos uh, loaded onto the flow cell in a random way, and only a small percentage of those are going to form clusters. So the sequencer has to actually, the camera and the software has to actually determine what the clusters are and call them as clusters. If you have good nucleotide diversity, you can form your clusters pretty densely and they can be right next to each other because the sequencer can easily distinguish that this, for instance, is two clusters because it's got two different bases at, a, at very many, at most of the places along the, the sequencing read, especially across the first four base pairs again. Um, and then if you have only one, if you have the same base at each position, with lo, which is what you see in low nucleotide diversity, if you have your clusters very close together, it's going to be very difficult for the instrument to know that this is two clusters. It looks like one cluster. It's just seeing a big bright spot for blue, G, whatever base pair I made that uh, blue color into. So the problem is that if you cluster too, too densely, you're going to have a lot of trouble. And by the time you get to the region of the guide RNAs where the clusters are diverse, like here, it's too late. The, the sequencer's already called this as one cluster, and now it's really confused because this one cluster suddenly forked and starts to express different, or starts to have different um, nucleotides detected within one cluster. And so basically the quality of that base call is very low because the sequencer can't determine how, what it should call, what base call it should give for that cluster. Uh, this paper, again, the slides are available, so some of this is just reference for you guys. There's a paper here that describes this in detail. So, so for the randomly um, seeded flow cells, you have to also consider your cluster density. So how are we going to solve these problems? I mean, all is not lost. What we can do is we can uh, spike in a control library, a well-balanced library. In a lab like the Yo Lab, where they have a lot of sequencing going on, they might use RNA-seq, which is pretty well-balanced as their control library. If you bring me a CRISPR screen just from your own lab and you don't have any other things to sequence, we'll spike in a PhiX control library. And this just gives enough nucleotide diversity, 10 or 15 percent on most sequencers, in order to set those thresholds. So the other problem, though, in defining those cluster boundaries, the PhiX doesn't help too much on that. What, what helps on defining the cluster boundaries is seeding your flow cell um, a little less dense than you normally would. So you have to back off on the random flow cells on the density that you can um, sequence at. So we go to, you know, between 60 or 50 and 75 percent of the max cluster density for, for these low diversity screens. Um, a second way, or a third way, I guess, to, to overcome this problem is to design your CRISPR libraries from the beginning to have a, uh, a more diverse read over those first four to 20 base pairs. And the way we do this is just by designing that first PCR primer with some different staggers in place in between the Illumina portion and the gecko compatible overhang. So you have to be a little bit careful. You can't just throw any random base in. You want to make sure that as you go across the reads, this is where the sequencing primer sticks down. So the first base that gets read is, is here, C, a G, a T, and an A. And we've, we've designed these primers, and they're available on the Google, this Google Drive, which is uh, working and you can just click on it when you get the slides and get the oligo design. We've designed these so that across at least the first four and then a little bit further, you have nice um, even nucleotide diversity uh, for each, for each uh, position in the read. And if you mix these four oligos together and call it your PCR1 5' prime primer and then PCR up for your first PCR with that primer and a the three prime primer, it'll help balance the diversity across the pool. Now, 
it's still not perfect, and so I still like to spike phyxin with these, but it does help a little bit, and, and it does also help, um, you know, so you can maybe load a little more library on those random primer, or those random seeded flow cells. So our sequencing solutions are spiking in phyx control, which we do in every case, even if you've used the stagger using the stagger design, which allows us to spike in a little bit less phyx, and then also for the ordered, for the random flow cells loading at a lower concentration. It's, it's challenging the first few times you sequence a, a new type of library to get that, that loading right on the random flow cells. So if you can, just sequence on our high output 4,000. It used to be very, the last presentation I gave, I think I said you had to spike in 40% phyx, but they've redone the algorithm um, at Illumina, and so you can, you can basically get the same quality data off the 4,000 now with a, a lower FIAC spike in, and you get a lot more data for your money, and you can't overload or underload. All right, so you figured out you know, how to make your library, you handed it off for sequencing, and we sequenced it, or maybe you sequenced it on your own sequencer, or you sent it somewhere for sequencing. Just be sure to communicate with whoever's going to sequence your libraries that you're doing a, a CRISPR screen, because it's not always obvious to the person running the instrument what you're doing. And they need to know that you need some kind of control library spiked in. So now you've got your data back, and you want to evaluate, like, is my sequencing data even any good? Can I use it? Do I need to tell the core to rerun it? Did they screw up? Did I screw up? What's going on? How do I even look at this? So Illumina has a, a sequencing analysis viewer software. It is downloadable on PCs. Anyone, it's free, anyone can use it. And in the data that we return to you, you, you should have all the files that you need to upload into that um, sequencing analysis viewer. However, we also pre-screen all this for you, and if we see problems, we'll let you know. So let's see what you're looking for. In these two panels, we have a good, successful sequencing run. It's actually a dual guide RNA. It's probably JP and Anna. I think they're both actually JP and Anna. And then on this side, we have a single, single um, guide RNA screen. This, this run is actually going to be a successful run. It had 167 million reads. And the Q30, the quality score, that means it, the percentage of the samples that you expect one base pair mutation in 1,000, or miscalled bases in 1,000, is 95%. But over here, the Q30 was only 61%. So why is this? So first, we're going to look at the base diversity. You can see, it's kind of like Sanger. You can tell. Um, how low your base diversity is, and this is pretty low, uh, by looking at the plot. So you have basically 90% of your bases are identical. The other 10% is from the Phyx control spike in. You can just read that right off the, the base composition of the sequencing run. You just toggle for different metrics on these arrows. On the other run, I think this run was probably a, a uh, staggered primer design, but the staggered primer design isn't perfect, and so at some points across the run, you will still end up lining up with low base diversity. It shouldn't matter that much as long as it's good across the first few bases, but you can see that you still have some areas of the, of the constant region where even though you put a stagger in, you've got some uh, completely the same base pair at, at the same position. All right, so why does this look bad? Now let's look at the cluster density. On the right-hand side, we have a cluster density of about 500,000 per, per, uh, clusters per millimeter squared. There's two bars here. One is blue and one is green. The blue bar is the total number of clusters, and the green is the number of clusters that pass filter. And so that means the number of clusters that could be unique, you know, easily determined and the boundaries drawn around them and everything looks good. On this side, the cluster density was about 1,000. This is probably from our early days, Anna. The cluster density was about 1,000, and the sequencer just couldn't find the unique clusters, and so the number of clusters passing filter tanked. So the first quality metric is the number of pa clusters passing filter, and you want that to be nice and tight. Uh, it can be a little bit lower. This is actually probably a little underloaded if we push it a little higher you'd have a little less passing filter. So it's okay to have some difference between the blue total number of clusters and the green passing filter clusters, but not this much difference. And then the second quality metric that you have to look at is the Q30 score. So not only were these um, clusters not passing filter at a high level, but the quality scores for the individual base calls are also really low compared to the lower density loading. You can always see, even on a good run, the, the quality scores for the guide uh, start 
to tank a little bit. I don't think this is real. Those, those quality scores, the sequencer thinks it's lower quality because it set all of its algorithm on this less base diverse region. Um, but in general, the quality scores on, on this lower clustered run are much higher than the quality scores you see over here on the over clustered run. So these are the kinds of things that you need to discuss with your sequencing core and the kinds of things you need to look at in your data. You don't want to just take your fast cues and run with your pipeline before you've QC'd your data at this most basic level. Um, because, you know, <laughs> Sometimes these types, of, these types of QCs aren't really built into the analysis pipelines, and people who don't know how to look at their sequencing data as it comes off the instrument can go really far and don't understand why their data doesn't look good, and it can be something as simple as your quality scores were terrible, or uh, you know, the, the way your libraries, the number of reads you got per library um, wasn't even. So there's some very basic metrics that you need to look at in your sequencing data as it comes off the sequencer. All right. So, to our little calculator slide, and then we'll finish up and go on the break. Um, how many reads do you need? It's, it's very similar to what we've already shown for all the other calculations. If you want to, to have a coverage of 100 cells per guide RNA, and your library size is 120,000 guide RNAs, you're going to need 12 million reads. Uh, in practice, people are probably getting more like 3 to 10 million reads for positive selection experiments and 20 plus million reads for negative selection experiments. What does this mean in terms of how you're going to design your sequencing run? On our HiSeq 4000, we get a yield of around 350 million reads total. You probably are going to end up with about a 20% FIAC spike in, so that leaves you with 280 million reads. Of these reads, about 80% are going to map properly, so you're going to be down to 224 million reads. This is just sort of ballpark. So for positive selection experiments, you can put a lot of samples in a lane. You're not going to have 75 samples. So design a lot of time points. You might as well sequence them if it's, if it's feasible and easy to design your PCR experiments. For your negative selection samples, you're going to want to put fewer samples per lane, probably more in the 9 to 10 sample range. Um, and in practice, People don't generally pool perfectly evenly on these, so you probably want to go a little under uh, where you think you want to be and end up with more data. Um, but we can always sequence again if you don't get enough data to do your analysis. So there's not too much to be lost if you accidentally under-sequence. If you're doing these on a different type of run, the MySeq gives about 10 million reads after you subtract for the FIAX, and the 2500 gives about 200 million reads after you that's probably an overestimate after you subtract for the FIAX. But if you can, put your sequencing stuff on the 4,000 because it's cheaper and it's easier to load and you're going to have more consistent um, data if you run on that sequencer. You can contact us uh, at our website. You can email me. Um, and I just, before we close, wanted to add one um, slide so that we have access to it when we pull the slides. There's a brand new paper out in Nature uh, Genetics. Am I ready for CRISPR, a user's guide to genetic screens? I think our team could have written this review. I don't know why we didn't. But uh, this, this could be, I have not looked at this because in full disclosure, I pulled this up at home and I didn't have time to try to log in and use the, you know, get access to it. But, but this should be a, a primer that can be used in combination with today's presentation and all the slides here. So thank you. And if you have questions, maybe we can chat at the break. Unless you really want to ask it in front of the whole group. Let's take a couple of questions right now. Uh, if, if you have an, actually, I have an answer why we didn't write this review. <laughs> it's because the younger generation doesn't read reviews, they watch YouTube. And so right now, the, the, the workshop is being streamed and, and recorded on YouTube, so you can go back to it. So that's why it's much more efficient. Yeah, you're right, it much is. Much more efficient. Okay, I'm not young enough. Questions for Kristen? Uh, I had one. What is the difference between a rapid run mode and a, over here? and a high throughput mode, and then why would you pick one for CRISPR screening in particular? Okay, so there are two different instruments. The t well, we, we run our 2500 in the rapid remote. It's a, it's a lower output flow cell. So let's say you had a really weird run configuration, like JP likes to run Paradin 75s or Paradin 50s. Um, we don't run a lot of those on our HiC 4000, so you would wait a really long time before that run would be filled and you could get your data off that run. But all other things being equal, if you can get your CRISPR screen designed in a way that it can be sequenced on a high output run, it's cheaper and 
you're going to get just more data for your dollar. Um, but basically, the, the rapid run is just a, a lower output sequencer. So if you need to buy a full run of some kind of weird run configuration, you, you can do that and not wait months and months for a full eight lane flow cell to accumulate with that run configuration. I just want to, I think I missed something. So what's the size of primers you're designing over here? The length of the primers? So, so Eric, Eric had, I think, a size on his slide. You're designing an insert for this library of about what, like 120, 130? It, it doesn't really matter. Somewhere, somewhere smaller than like 200 base pairs, let's say. You want to aim, the sequencer can't sequence really, really long fragments, but anything up to an insert size of 200 should be no problem. But most of the CRISPR screens are probably in the 120 range. Less? I mean, usually the, the, the total length is not a huge problem. It's supposed to be within you know, 50 or 75 of right. the 5 prime size. Yeah, I mean, it, you don't want it to be a, a full KB or something because the sequencer has trouble with super long molecules, and PCR will be a pain too. But you really just want to focus on your five prime side and keeping your guide RNA within a certain region, and then wherever you can design a, an oligo that has good melting temperature, basically on the other side is is fine. But most people, it, it's a couple hundred base pairs at most away from the uh, insert size. One more. Uh, I'll wait for the microphone. Is she passing it? Uh, I have a question about the single race. Would it possible that uh, if I run single race, but we have uh, have two index? Because I know single race usually have one index, but would it possible have two index? Don't worry. Everyone's always worried about that. Okay, so Illumina has a, a dual indexing strategy. Uh, I don't have any great slides for it. All right, so, so if you sequence single index, I mean single read, but you have two indexes, one at the five prime side and one at the three prime side, this is how the sequencing proceeds. First you stick down the read one primer and you read your read of insert. Then you stick down the index two primer and you read your index sequence. Then the flow, the library kind of bends around and you stick down to the grafted primer on the flow cell and read the second index on the I5 side. So it's a, it, you can absolutely sequence dual index libraries on single read runs. Don't worry. Sometimes people, other cores tell people they can't. You absolutely can. The strategy is just a tiny bit different, but you don't need to worry about that. Yes, just say you have a dual index library. We basically sequence every single single read 75 run we do as dual indexed. It's the same price. For the same price. <laughs> because we're mixing lots of different customers and most people are sequencing dual index nowadays. I mean, I, I didn't really get into the other problem with the ordered flow cells or whatever they're called, the pattern flow cells, and that's the index hopping issue. If you're interested, you can just Google Illumina index hopping and you'll get plenty of hits. We're moving to a model where we use two unique dual indexes on both size of the molecule instead of a, sort of a plate-based grid model where you share indexes. Because there are some issues with index hopping um, on the 4,000 that don't exist on other sequencers. So we can talk about that at the break if you're super interested. But make sure your libraries, I didn't really go too much over the library QC and maybe Eric and I should have put one slide in. Don't have any free primer in your libraries when you submit it for sequencing. Or ask us to QC it again. If for eight bucks, it can't hurt. And we can just make sure that your libraries look good and you're going to sequence with no issues. Because if you have a messy library with a lot of adapter dimer, you're going to have problems resolving those indexes. And we can talk about that offline. All right. Thank you, Kristen. We're going to break now. We'll be back at three.